Hello in Velberg. Hello, Clarks. I'm David Truex from Melbourne, Australia. Thank you, Lauren, for introducing me beforehand in your presentation. Saves me the trouble. I'm here to talk about uh, the comparative uh, law differences between England and Australia with specific reference to forum and jurisdiction disputes, but also a comparison of some aspects of the law of both countries um, with the idea that uh, South African lawyers, my audience, will be able to look at those differences between those two countries and then apply their local knowledge to uh, a question of how do you deal with a forum or jurisdiction dispute with Australia uh, or with the jurisdiction of England and Wales. I'm not, uh, I have very little knowledge of South African uh, law, so that's why I'm dealing just with the English and the Australian law and leaving it to you to put the South African piece of jigsaw into the puzzle so that it all makes sense, hopefully. Now, before we get started on the substance, I would like to share with you that I was reading through a copy of Long Walk to Freedom and found this photograph of a law library, which shows predominantly a copy of Bromley's Family Law. Now, if you had been sentenced to life in prison, would you choose Bromley's Family Law as one of your books to take with you? Uh, it must have been a very dedicated family lawyer who made that decision. So family lawyers of South Africa, we are in good company. Now, to the uh, principles of dealing with international disputes, I created what I have called the 10 Commandments of International Family Law Practice some years ago, and I've used them in a number of presentations with some editing uh, along the way. Here are rules that I've always tried to follow when looking at uh, issues of jurisdiction and forum when comparing either Australia or England and Wales with another jurisdiction. Number one, always ask every new client for details of all possibly relevant jurisdictions. Once you know that, get advice from all of the lawyers in every relevant jurisdiction before taking any action whatsoever, before you write a letter to the opposition, before you start any proceedings especially. Ensure that your client issues and serves proceedings first in the most favorable jurisdiction, because that will then secure that jurisdiction, certainly in terms of um, a priority uh, subject to any later decisions by a court in terms of change of jurisdiction. Consider the possibility of using two or more jurisdictions for different aspects of a family law dispute that is possible in some circumstances, and always keep an open mind when you are looking at foreign family law systems be tolerant of their differences when their standards and values may be different to the ones you know at your home jurisdiction. There are also some negative aspects to what you should not do, and they include never issue divorce proceedings in a jurisdiction, well, not never, usually do not issue divorce proceedings in a jurisdiction which is not the one where your client needs orders in relation to real property or retirement benefits. For example, if your client has his or her pension benefits and real property in England, uh, you may cause difficulties with jurisdictional ability to deal with those um, issues in England if you start a divorce in England, I beg your pardon, in Australia or in South Africa. Never apply for custody or residence orders in relation to a child if that child may have been wrongfully removed or retained out of another jurisdiction, because by applying for a custody or residence order in the new jurisdiction, the removed to jurisdiction, you may be giving the home jurisdiction party uh, a perfect excuse to start a Hague abduction convention uh, application, uh, because you've indicated that um, you, by starting your proceedings in the foreign jurisdiction, 
intend to stay there. Uh, do not uh, commence proceedings when, uh, unless you know about how that might affect the immigration or residence or tax status of uh, your client or other parties. Um, if you write a letter or make a statement in a court document about your habitual residence, for example, if that comes to the attention of the immigration or tax authorities, uh, you may find that that client's interests have been prejudiced. Um, this is an important one, often um, not uh, recognized. Do not let a client take a child out of the home jurisdiction for a long term stay uh, on condition that the child will be returned. It doesn't have to be a long term stay. If the child is out of the jurisdiction for any uh, significant period of time, it may be that the habitual residence of that child will change to the what was intended to be a holiday destination and the left behind parent in the home jurisdiction uh, may find that they will need to issue Hague proceedings to uh, get the to attempt to get the child returned to the home jurisdiction. And finally, never allege adultery in any case where the adulterer is resident in a country which executes adulteries. That speaks for itself. Now let's look at the culture of family law. I've got three images there. You would have gathered from what I was saying earlier that the question of deciding jurisdiction or forum is one which is quite binary. You either win the jurisdiction and forum case or you lose it and the other side wins. It's very hard to compromise. It's very hard to apply this area of law to mediation, uh, collaborative law and other uh, alternative dispute resolution models because it's difficult, if not impossible, to compromise between two binary positions. You either win or you lose, like the boxing kangaroo. At least he is wearing his boxing gloves. He's obviously a gentleman. He um, plays the game according to the Queensbury rules. Uh, contrast that. Meerkat in South Africa seems to be in a battle uh, to the death with what appears to be a cobra. Um, there don't seem to be any marks of Queensbury rules or any other rules in that fight. Uh, it's a desperate win or lose situation. That chap uh, is an English gentleman uh, by the name of Harold Larwood. He was a test cricketer in the 1930s, and he invented the leg bowling uh, or body line bowling, uh, which he used to great effect in 1933 against the Australians in uh, the tests and uh, because he was bowling at the batsman's head rather than at the stumps, the batsmen were ducking and weaving and getting out and uh, the English beat the Australians in the 1933 tests. Now he later, uh, he was vilified at the time of course for inventing new rules or breaking the rules, but he later migrated to Australia and made uh, good friends. Now uh, let's go to the um, implications of these cultural differences um, when you consider whether a jurisdiction is uh, a boxing kangaroo or something less than that. Look at Australia. Here are the rules for deciding a forum dispute in Australia. The rule is different from that in most other countries. In Australia, if one party commences proceedings and then another party objects to that jurisdiction and says, I would like to stay the Australian proceedings because a better jurisdiction for me is South Africa or England. Uh, the judge will apply what is called the clearly inappropriate forum test. In other words, the applicant for the stay of the Australian proceedings must show that it is vexatious or oppressive to him or her for the proceedings to continue in Australia. That is a very high threshold. The most recent uh, summary of the law is in the case of O'Bannon and Scarf. Citation is there, 2021, in the Appeal Court of the Family Court in Australia. And the uh, paragraphs 100, 110 uh, summarise uh, the approach of the Australian Court. Whether or not Australia is a clearly inappropriate forum depends on an assessment of exhaustive, non-exhaustive factors. And there are some paragraphs A to J uh, in that um, paragraph uh, in, 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 the, in, in the case of Henry. 
um, and the other subsidiary cases from which O'Bannon and Scoif derive the law are set out uh, on the slide. Um, now, compare the situation in England and Wales, where the test in foreign disputes is which is the more convenient forum. It's not a question of one party having to prove that a jurisdiction is vexatious or oppressive uh, or clearly inappropriate. You simply uh, look at the balance of convenience. And uh, in fact, um, in, in English uh, foreign disputes, it, it's much easier, uh, therefore, to persuade a judge to stay English proceedings in favour of foreign juris uh, jurisdiction if it seems to be a more suitable jurisdiction. So the threshold is much, uh, much lower in England, and each country has its own rules. But the foreign convenience test, as in England, is most commonly applied around the world. Uh, now, let's talk about the process of one aspect of family law, divorce and financial claims, and compare the English and the Australian systems. The Australian family law does not connect the divorce proceedings and the financial claims. It, it, bifurcation, in other words, of the two sets of proceedings. For example, in Australia, you can apply to the court for final financial orders without ever ending the marriage, and a number of people do that. Foreign divorce does not negate the Australian court's jurisdiction to make final financial orders. Um, compare the situation in England where financial applications are dependent for jurisdiction on the principal relief proceedings. Unless you start a divorce or dissolution for civil partnerships in the English jurisdiction, as a general rule, there is no jurisdiction for the English court to deal with financial or ancillary uh, issues. Um, you, 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 you must have a divorce or dissolution application on foot to start your financial application. Limited exceptions, but that's the general rule. And uh, the other thing is that uh, when there has been a foreign divorce, um, you cannot, as of right, apply to the English court for financial orders, even if property or the retirement benefits are in England, uh, you have to apply to the court for special permission to proceed after a foreign divorce, and that permission is not always given. Um, this may indicate to you how important it is to choose the right jurisdiction for divorce and make sure the other party to the dispute does not beat you to the punch uh, with a jurisdiction choice. The consequences are that, uh, well, some of the consequences, the disputes over divorce or dissolution jurisdiction are more common in England than in Australia. In England, it is more important to win the jurisdiction race, and uh, that encourages uh, a race to start proceedings to end the relationship first in the jurisdiction of your choice. It, therefore, uh, perhaps perversely, in England, uh, parties are forced to seek an end to the marriage just to get final financial orders. There is no such pressure in Australia to end the relationship because you can get a financial order without getting divorced. It's substantive law. We've moved on from process to substantive law, and it's first of all important to understand just a little bit about the constitutional law uh, differences between England and Australia. And uh, as a federal uh, jurisdiction in Australia, it's complicated because the family law competence is split between the federal and the state and territory jurisdictions. The Family Court, now called the Federal Circuit and Family Court of Australia, deals with dissolution, divorce, financial claims, and international recognition of parenting disputes. Um, the state and territory courts deal with adoption, child welfare, and inheritance, and there is shared jurisdiction in relation to some issues like domestic violence. Western Australia, is a separate family law jurisdiction. They administer a mixture of their own state family law and federal family law in their own family court of Western Australia, not the Family Court of Australia. And some of their procedures and laws are very different. And I'm not going to be talking about Western Australia because uh, 
I'm not qualified as a Western Australian lawyer. In England and Wales, there is a unitary system of family law. In other words, there's one family court for the entire nation, and there are rather complicated jurisdiction rules to deal with demarcation disputes between England and Wales as one jurisdiction, and on the other hand, Scotland and Northern Ireland and other jurisdictions affiliated in various ways with the United Kingdom. Consequences of that are that litigants need to know which jurisdiction to start proceedings in. You can't retain a Sydney solicitor for a Western Australian case, or you shouldn't. Uh, and you don't start a divorce in Scotland if your jurisdictional criteria point to the English jurisdiction. Um, and I hope that that summary of those two countries can be of some use to you in deciding jurisdiction issues and foreign issues when it comes to South Africa. Next, there are differences between divorce and dissolution. Now, divorce in Australia applies to um, marriages. Um, there's no dissolution, uh, which is an English term dealing with civil partnerships. In Australia, we have no-fault divorce. The hearing date is fixed. When you issue your application, it's normally two to three months ahead. It all happens very fast. You can do a joint application. It's a remote online process. There's no court attendance. But if there's some disputed issue, a telephone hearing uh, can take place. Also, if there are children involved, a hearing, a telephone hearing can take place. So the judge is satisfied that the children are being properly cared for. Irretrievable breakdown in Australia in order to gain the divorce is evidenced by 12 months of separation. That is the sole ground. Unless you are separated for 12 months, you cannot even start a divorce in Australia. And it takes about three months from start to finish to get an Australian divorce order. And then that order becomes automatically effective one month later. An identical process for same-sex marriages. Now, compare the situation in England. There are some subtle differences. Also, since April of 2022, uh, England has had a no-fault system for divorce, uh, whether it's marriages or for dissolution, if it's a civil partnership. Joint applications like Australia, remote like Australia, irretrievable breakdown is evidenced just by a statement. No separation period required. Very different from Australia. And what that means is even a couple living together, one of them can just sign a statement saying, I consider that the marriage is broken down irretrievably. It can then apply to the court for the um, divorce or dissolution. Uh, the court uh, will fix a date after service has been proved. So if service is difficult and is taking a long time, or has to be done according to Hague Service Convention in an overseas country, the actual process of getting the divorce can take a lot longer in England and Wales than it can in Australia. The court makes a conditional order at first, used to be called Decree Nisai, and then six weeks later, the applicant applies for the final order, used to be called Decree Absolute. Same procedure for same-sex marriages, but slightly different for civil partnerships in terms of dissolution. And what that means is if there's a jurisdiction race between England and Australia, um, if you've got past your 12 months separation period in Australia, you're probably likely to get your divorce before the English uh, jurisdiction will complete their, their divorce. Um, but if, if uh, the, it, it's less than seven, 12 months of separation, the English divorce can be started sooner and could finish sooner. So that's the divorce issues. When you look at the consequences, the Jurisdiction races can be quite interesting and complicated because of the time differences that I've just summarised. And um, and I've explained those differences in terms of cohabitation and separation, so I don't need to repeat that information for slide 15. Uh, now, when we're looking at civil partnerships, I've already explained that we have uh, no civil partnerships in the English sense in Australia. Each uh, or I think most Australian states and territories have state law relating to something called civil partnership by registration, but that's been largely superseded by the introduction of de facto relationships legislation uh, in the 1980s by state, and then a federal uh, jurisdiction uh, um, introduced same-sex marriage in 2017. Um, in England and Wales, civil partnerships 
uh, for same and mixed gender uh, relationships are governed by national law, not by state law. And um, of course, when you're comparing marriage and civil partnerships, there are differences in the way inheritance and an entitlement to share pensions uh, can be dealt with. That's an important factor to take into account when a client says, do I have to get married or should I just do de facto relationships or civil partnerships or whatever? Now, um, in Australia, uh, we have something called de facto relationships, uh, which is basically treating a couple living together, but not married, as if they were married. This legislation was introduced first in New South Wales, 1984, and federal uh, legislation was introduced in 2009. Now, it started off by having to uh, prove that you were in a, domestic, a, a de facto relationship by the fact that you'd lived together for a period of time, I think it was two years originally, or that you had a child born of the relationship. Now, the legislation simply says you just have to prove that you have a relationship as a couple living together on a genuine domestic basis. Pretty easy to prove, I think. So basically, anybody living together has a pretty good, job, easy job of proving that they're a de facto in Australia. And then that means that they uh, can use the same law that applies to married couples for things like maintenance uh, and property adjustment cases, including superannuation or pension sharing. Compare England and Wales, where there is no special de facto relationships law and uh, cohabiting couples are uh, governed by the law of equity, common law, contracts and trusts, unless you can establish a contractual entitlement to some, I admit to really, contractual entitlement to some right to property or to prove that it would be inequitable. Uh, for example, someone made a promise, look, you know, my house will always be your house and the person to whom that promise is made has acted to detriment. That can sometimes get you the foot in the door for a financial claim in a cohabitation relationship, but that claim is not made in the family court. It's made in the high court in the chancery division where all the commercial cases are heard and the law, the substantive law, the laws of evidence and the way the proceedings are run is very different to the way it is done in the family court. Basically, it's a tougher it's a tougher arena in which to fight litigation. So cohabiting couples in the jurisdiction of England and Wales are at a significant disadvantage in terms of getting um, a court to um, to to provide fair solutions for them um, where they are in dispute. Um, and and there have been talk there has been talk of amending this legislation, uh, amending the law, bringing in a cohabitation law or a domestic. Uh, relationships law, uh, but it's stalled in the parliament and is currently, as far as I'm aware, going nowhere. They've got other things to worry about at the time. Financial claims. In Australia, there is a broad discretion in terms of how property is divided up um, with a strong direction to a clean financial break. The overarching criteria for assessing property settlements in Australia is the contributions made by the parties to the asset pool, both financial and non-financial. So a home maker party who has not contributed financially can still be said to be contributing equally to the breadwinner um, uh, in terms of contributions. Financial needs of each of the parties are treated as a secondary consideration. Um, and you don't get spousal maintenance in Australia unless you have clear, adequate reasons. It's not a straightforward thing to get spousal maintenance in Australia. And the um, culture in Australia is to divide matrimonial assets evenly in most cases, perhaps with an additional 10 to 20 percent to the less well off party, where there is a significant disparity between their financial relationship their situations. Compare England and Wales, where the Matrimonial Causes Act in Section 79 has a very powerful first subparagraph, it shall be the duty of the court to have regard to all the circumstances of the case, first consideration being given to the welfare, while a minor, of any child of the family who's not attained the age of 18. 
Now that's a rather special piece of legislation. There is nothing like it in Australia. In fact, when the Australians uh, considered introducing something in Australia, they said, no thanks. <laughs> Why should we allow third parties to have an interest in the family property? Of course, by third parties, um, they meant the children. Uh, my own personal view is that that was a rather brutal attitude to take to children, but that's the way it is in Australia. Um, the English court also has a broad discretion in terms of how it divides up property. Uh, there is a moderate steer towards a clean break, unless this would affect the child's welfare. But it is possible in um, England and Wales to get a deferred clean break, for example, um, where the um, parent with primary care of children, uh, especially young children, uh, needs a home to live in with them. Quite often a court will say, we're going to wait until the children are independent past the age of 18 or secondary or tertiary education. And in that period of time, the mother and the children or the parent with, father, care, parent with care and the children can live in the family home. And at the end of that period, the property will be sold and the proceeds divided. So um, it's not always an immediate clean break in England. Fairness is the like, overarching criterion for dividing uh, assets up in England, tested by the yardstick of equality. And if you need uh, a departure from the set, the equal division of matrimonial assets, you need to explain your reasons. Um, you can uh, actually quite often get more than that. Pardon me, back a bit further. Sorry about my incompetence with the moving forward. Yes, uh, the overarching consideration in most English cases is the needs of the parties and uh, contributions are secondary. In other words, uh, quite often in English cases, you will find that the party with the uh, over, overwhelming needs uh, in relation to the other, other party, uh, especially with the care of children, especially if there are disabilities involved or inability to work, um, the division of assets can be significantly uh, different from a 50-50 equal division, notwithstanding the yardstick of equality, um, because needs in England trumps uh, the contributions, needs of children especially for housing are the first consideration. Quite often you will find in England that a party who is less financially advantaged or has the care of especially young children uh, will receive a significantly greater than 50% share of the assets and on occasions spousal maintenance as well and child support. Right, well, um, that's a quick run through. I'm David Truex, I hope that's been useful. I hope that the recording of this um, session, which I have not yet checked, <laughs> comes through clear enough and all of the slides and the narrative match up. Thank you very much for listening. If uh, you need to have more information, as Lawrence did during her presentation, you are welcome to email or ring us. I've got a London telephone number direct plus a UK iPhone and an Australian iPhone. So whichever is best for you, you can get, call me on those using WhatsApp or FaceTime. Otherwise, send me a, a, an email and uh, I shall respond. Thank you very much for inviting me to speak and uh, take care.